Today I'll be going over the wave from the Code Chef June Cookoff 2021 Division 3. So let's look at the problem statement. Chef is stuck in the wavy world of polynomials. You are given all n roots of a polynomial. These roots are pairwise distinct integers, but they are not given in any particular order. To help Chef escape, you should answer Q carries, numbered 1 through Q. For each valid i in the ith carry, you are given an integer xi, and you have to determine whether p of xi is positive, negative, or zero. Let's quickly go over this problem with a few example test cases. So first, looking at our example input. So you have the number four, meaning the number of roots we have in our input, and we have the number six, which is the number of carries. So when constructing a polynomial using the given roots, the polynomial will be of the form x minus r1 times x minus r2 times x minus r3, so on till x minus rn, where r1, r2, and so on till rn are the roots of the polynomial. So in the input, we are given the roots to be 1, 3, 5, and 100. So the polynomial we will construct from this is x minus 1 times x minus 3 times x minus 5 times x minus 100. So now, how would we determine whether if we plug in a value for x, if it'll be positive, negative, or zero. Let's look at a few example test cases. So let's um, check out the value at negative two. So in this case, if we plug in negative two, we'll see negative two minus one times negative two minus three times negative two minus five times negative two minus 100. Now keep in mind that we only are focusing on whether this value is positive, negative, or zero. We don't actually care about the integer value itself, just the sign. So in this case, we would notice that this value is negative 3, so it's negative. This is negative 5, so it's negative. Negative 7, it's negative. And this one is negative 102, so it's negative. And of course, if you multiply four negative integers together, the results will be positive. So we've already found our result for the first test case. If you plug in negative 2 to this polynomial, the result will be positive. Let's look at the second example test case. Um, let's look at the example of 2. Let's plug in these values. We would have 2 minus 1 times 2 minus 3 times 2 minus 5 times 2 minus 100. 2 minus 1 is going to be 1, which is positive. 2 minus 3 will be negative 1, which is negative. 2 minus 5 will be negative 3, which is negative. And 2 minus 100 will be negative 98. And if you multiply all of those together, you'll notice that one positive integer multiplied by three negative integers will result in negative. So our answer for two would be negative. Now let's look at this final test case at the value of five. If we plug in the value of five, we'll see five minus one times five minus three times five minus five times five minus 100. This will end up in the value of four times two times zero times negative 95, which will end up in the result of zero. So in this case, we would just point out zero. So now let's go over the key ideas to form the solution to this problem. So suppose we have our roots r1, r2, all the way up to rn, and for simplicity, let's just assume they're in sorted order. So now if we, we want to determine whether x minus r1 will be positive, negative, or zero, whether x minus r2 will be positive, negative, or zero, and so on, all the way up to x minus rn. So how would we determine this? Well, let's just focus on x minus r1 for now. We have three cases. The first case is if r1 is greater than x. Then if we subtract r1 from both sides, because we're subtracting it in the expression, we would see that r1 minus r1 is greater than x minus r1, and 0 is greater than x minus r1, which means that x minus r1 is going to be negative, because it is less than 0. The second test case we have is if r1 is equal to x. Then if we subtract r1 from both sides, we have r1 minus r1 is equal to x minus r1, and 0 is equal to x minus r1. Then we know that the expression terminates to 0. And the third test case is if we have r1 is less than x. If we subtract r1 from both sides, we have r1 minus r1 is less than x minus r1, and 0 is less than x minus r1 which means that x minus r1 is greater than 0, and it is positive. And we can apply this for any root. Instead of r1, we can have r2, or r3, or rn, or whatever we want. But in general, this is how we can find out whether the expression will be positive, negative, or 0. 
And from this, we can conclude our solution. Our solution is for each value of x or for each carry, we're going to go through the roots. And based off of these three if conditions or test cases, we're going to determine if the expression terminates to negative, zero, or positive. Then we're going to find the number of negative expressions, number of positive expressions, and the number of a zero expression. And by an expression, I mean x, for example, x minus r1 is an expression, right? And if this terminates to a negative value from our test case, then we know that it's a negative expression. If it terminates to a positive value from our test case, we know it's a positive expression. Now, in order to finally conclude our solution after we get all these three values, note that if a zero expression is there, right? So if one of these expressions terminates to zero, any number multiplied by zero is equal to zero. So if one of them is equal to zero, then the answer will be zero if one of them is equal to zero. Now, moving on to the number of negative expressions, if none of them are equal to zero, then if we have an odd number of negative expressions, the value will be negative. Because for every two negative expressions, negative times negative, we will get a positive value. But if there are three negative expressions, we will get a negative, right? Because these two will become positive, and then a positive multiplied by a negative will be a negative. So from these key observations, we have concluded our solution. So now let's go over the implementation of our solution. So our solution, as we discovered, is to go through, for each of the queries, we would go through all of the roots, and we would use the three test cases to see if the expression would be positive, negative, or zero. And then from there, we can determine our answer. So how do we be able to implement this? We have n roots and q carries. And by the problem statement, each of these can be up till 2 times 10 to the 5 which means that if we're going through every single test case, this could end up becoming 4 times 10 to the 10, or basically 2 times 10 to the 5, five squared, which is too much runtime for one second. So how do you be able to cut down on this runtime? And to cut down on it, we would be able to use the upper bound function. Now basically what this function does is it returns an iterator pointing to the first element that is greater than the value in a sorted list. Or for example, suppose I have a list or an array of the values 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50. And I would like to know what is the upper bound of the value 35. Then what I would do is I would go to my list. I would find the smallest element that is greater than or equal to 35. So in this case, the smallest element that is greater than or equal to 35 is 40. If I were to ask the upper bound of the value 25, then that would end up pointing me to the value 30, because 30 is the smallest value that is greater than or equal to 25. And similarly, if I were to do it for the value 20, then it would go to 20, because 20 is the smallest value that is greater than or equal to 20. So this is kind of how the upper bound function works. If you want more information about it, I can post some links in the description that can point you towards more information. Um, but since I'm going to quickly go over the solution to this problem specifically, I'm not going to go too in-depth as to how this function works. But one more important thing to keep in mind is the runtime of the upper bound function. And the runtime is logarithmic, meaning that if we were to use this, um, we would not get an n-square solution. So real quickly, just to show you how this upper bound function would be applied is, so suppose we have our input where our roots are 1, 3, 5, and 100. And suppose we're going to use a value of negative 2. So how would this work? We would use the upper bound function on the value of negative 2. And that would point us to the value of 1. And we can find the index of this to be 0, because the value of 1 is at index 0. And I'll show you how we can find this index from the upper bound function. But basically, now that we've found that the index is at zero, we know that all of these values have to be greater than or equal to negative two. So we know that n minus zero, or n values, right, because we have n roots where n is equal to four, will be greater than or equal to negative two. Now, in order to make sure that they are not equal to each other, we will look at the index. So we'll check, okay, is the array at the upper bound value, or array at zero, 
equal to negative 2, which means that it would not terminate to 0 and the value would continue being negative. So since all of these values are greater than negative 2, we note that all of these values will end up being negative in the expression. And therefore, since there are n of these values, there would be uh, the number of expressions that end up being negative will be n. And since n is equal to 4, there would be four negative expressions. The value will terminate to positive. So let's look at the example of the number 2. In this case, we would find our upper bound here in our array of 1, 3, 5, and 100. And that would point us to 3, which is at index 1. So that means that from here, n minus 1 values are going to be greater than or equal to 2. So therefore, the expression will end up terminating to negative. Again, just to make sure that it doesn't terminate to 0, we'll check. Okay, is the array at position 1 equal to 2? In this case, it's not. So all these values will terminate to negative. And in this case, since n is equal to 4, that means that three values will be negative, meaning that our answer will be negative. Finally, if we were to look at the value of 5, the upper bound would go to 5, because 5 is the least integer that is greater than or equal to 5. And in this case, this would be at index 2. So in this case, we know that, okay, there will be n minus 2 numbers, which are greater than or equal to 5. Or in this case, there would be 4 minus 2, which equals to 2 numbers, that will be negative, or the expression will turn into a negative value. But we also need to check, okay, r at position 2, is that equal to 5 or not? In this case, it is equal to 5. So in this case, the expression x minus 5, when the value 5 is plugged in, will terminate to 5 minus 5, which is equal to 0. So we just need to check this one case. If the array at the upper bound index is equal to the query we're putting in, then the expression will terminate to 0. If not, we can just use this formula, n minus the index. If you were to use the formula, n minus the index to find out how many negative values there will be, because this is the amount of values that will be greater than or equal to the upper bound value. So now let's go over the code solution to this video. Since I've already explained the solution in depth, I'm just going to show you the general code and explain the bits and chunks of it. So of course, first we input into n and q, where n is the amount of roots and q is the amount of carries, and then we take in our roots in an array. Now, in order for the upper bound function to work, these roots must be sorted. So we sort the roots from least to greatest. Now, moving on from here, we're going to go through all the carries. So first we will input a carry. Then we're going to find the index of the upper bounds of that carry. And the way we do it is by typing upper underscore bound. And then inside we have three values. And this is going to be the beginning value. Then we're going to put roots plus n. This means that we're going to search the entire array from the beginning at roots to the end at roots plus n. Then we're going to put the value which we want to find the upper bound for. And in this case, we want to find the upper bound of the carry in the array roots. So now in order to find the index of this, we would have to just um, write this sub minus roots. And this is just the syntax we use to find the, the integer index for the upper bound. So now first we want to make sure it's zero index, so we're going to check if the roots at the upper bound index is equal to input, and if so, we're going to print out zero. Now, if, again, we check out our next case, n minus the upper bound value, then we're going to check out the n minus upper bound value. If there is an odd number of negative signs in our expression, of course we're going to print out negative, and if there is not, then we're going to print out positive. And this is how we get our solution.